Hello, and welcome to Psychology 101, Introduction to Psychology. This is Section 1, where we're going to discover Hello, and welcome to Psychology 101, Introduction to Psychology. This is Professor Brad Mitchell of Ivy Tech Community College, Northwest Region, Valparaiso Campus. Today we're going to be going over Session 1 of Psychology 101, where we'll discover some of the history of psychology, as well as review the scientific method. We'll begin by looking at our learning objectives. During this session, we will define psychology and look at the scope of psychology and some of its subfields. We'll summarize the goals of the discipline, identify, identify influential people, and list and summarize the major perspectives of psychology. Additionally, we're going to evaluate pseudo-psychology, describe how psychologists use the scientific method, summarize the importance of the random sample, recognize the forms of descriptive research, explain how the experimental method relates cause and effect, and finally, demonstrate an understanding of research ethics. So let's begin by just describing what is psychology. Many students who come into a Psych 101 class have a short idea of what they might be thinking they're going to study. They might believe that they're going to be studying people who have abnormalities or who act strangely. They might think that they're going to be studying the scientific method of researching the brain or the neurology of the human being. And while some of those are components of psychology, psychology as a whole is defined as the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. These are the two major components of psychology. Mental processes are the internal components, the things that we can't see in each other, and behavior is the, uh, the visible portion of the mental process. It's the manifestation of the mental process. A psychologist is a scientist who works in a variety of fields some of them studying behavior and underlying mental processes, others working in schools, some working in universities, some doing research, some working in the field of human resources or sports or uh, organizational development. There's tons of different psychologists out there, and almost every single uh, industry uses psychological science and psychologists in one way or another. There are a multitude of different places where psychologists work and different specializations that you can use in psychology. A majority of people who would call themselves a psychologist work in either practice, being the human services field, managed care, hospitals, or independent practice, or higher education. There are quite a few of indiv individuals who are psychologists who work for the business or government. Uh, one subsection that is very uh, popular is military psychology, where psychologists work with uh, civilians and enlisted individuals to uh, get the best performance possible. When we look at the areas of specialization, you can see that an overwhelming number of clinicians uh, are psychologists. So uh, while many people study counseling and clinical psychology, there are other uh, clinicians out there, such as psychiatrists, clinical social workers, clinical nurses, psychiatric nurses, mental health technicians. Those would all under, fall under the same grouping that the clinical psychologist would work. But if you see, there's a little under 50% of people who don't fit the traditional view of the clinical psychologist. The educational psychologist who studies the development of individuals and how they can learn best school psychologists who spend quite a bit of time testing and assessing individuals in schools, developmental psychologists who work closely with educational psychologists, uh, specifically with people with uh, disabilities, uh, developmental disabilities, and, and sometimes people who have extraordinary abilities, um, and then organizational psychology, industrial psychology. These individuals tend to work with human resource departments or groups and organizations. Uh, a subsection of IO psychology is sports psychology where uh, individuals come to an, an I.O. psychologist with the hopes of uh, achieving greater success in their chosen field, and sometimes those are athletes. There are two major organizations that we, uh, we know of that work primarily in the United States, um, also Canada and Mexico, but primarily in the United States, and that is the APA and the APS. 
To be certain, the APA is a little bit larger, uh, but the APS is also just as important. The APA is a professional organization for psychologists that uh, advocates for the psychological profession and also advocates for uh, ethical and moral treatment of clients. The APS is designed more for the uh, academic psychologists, so the scientists who work in the psychological field. The scope of psychology is that we have both basic research and applied research. Basic research focuses on collecting data and gathers information for the sake of knowledge. In a Psych 101 course, we are going to spend much of our time on basic research and then dabble in some applied research because we want to know how to functionally use the basic research. Basic research is uh, important, but it's relatively worthless if we don't go ahead and use it in an applied setting. Applied research focuses on people, focuses on changing behaviors, focuses on mental illnesses. These are the real world applications that psychologists actually use out in practice. The four major goals of psychology can be broken down into four basic words. Describe, explain, predict, and control. Now, control sounds a little bit uh, evil and has nefarious uh, undertones, but really the control mechanism, when we get to that point, is going to make a lot of sense. The description is the what. What are we seeing? What is going on? What's going on with the people and how they're interacting? The explanation is the why, is where we try to understand the behaviors that we're seeing. Why are we doing this? Why are people acting like that? Why can't people control themselves? The prediction is when will this happen in the future? What things can we put into place that might change the future? And what uh, things can we do that will not change things? Finally, control. We're looking to shape, modify, and control behaviors. This is not mind control. This is not uh, Manchurian candidate hypnosis. What we're trying to do here is set people up for the ideal situation for them to be successful. Psychologists often work with organizations to figure out how to minimize injury or minimize the utilization of sick days so that uh, the workers can get the most out of their, their day at their job and the companies they work for get the most out of their employees. So instead of trying to control people, they try to set up the environment so that it's conducive and, and set up perfectly for people to be successful. Looking at the roots of uh, psychology, um, pre-1879, we really don't have something called psychology. It's 1879 where we first see uh, the field of psychology take place. So what we're going to talk about here is pre-psychology, pre-science. Plato and Aristotle, going back about 2,500 years, looked at the ideas of dualism, truth, and knowledge. So according to Plato, all of these things exist in the soul before birth. So we have the capacity to unlock it, but it's inside of us. Aristotle put out the idea that knowledge is the result of experience. So as we start to look at some of the fields of psychology, you're going to see that Plato is really almost like a structuralist, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, where Aristotle is almost like a behaviorist. The behaviorist believes that knowledge is the result of experiences. So nurture plays a role in knowledge acquisition. Nurture is how we act. Nature is who we are. We go ahead, we go ahead about 2,000 years, and it's the next big step in the psychological sciences. Again, pre-psychology, so we're not calling these people psychologists, but these are ideas that were fundamental to the field of psychology. Descartes comes up again uh, with something that's already been put out there, just not formulated in this way, the idea of dualism. The mind and body, the soul and body, the spirit and body, whatever it is you want to call it, interact as separate entities. So they are separate, intertwined, and you really can't separate the two of them. Descartes didn't have a really good idea of how this worked, and in fact, he just postulated that this, uh, the idea of dualism, the mind and body or the spirit and body, came together in the pineal gland. And we know today that that's probably not 100% accurate, but for 
the pre uh, pre-biological, pre-neurological days that Descartes was living in, it was a, it was a good guess. Uh, we move forward to look at um, some of the ideas that have really stuck with us, and we will say that Descartes' idea of dualism has stuck with us quite a bit, because this idea of the body parts working together, but there being something uh, something that we just can't put our finger on, that the mind, or as Freud will put it later as we talk, the subconscious. Uh, these are things that we can't put our finger on. We can't extract it from the body, but we know that it's playing a part in the body. And here's that year of 1879. Um, most people attribute either the years 1861 or 1879 as the beginning of psychology, the birth of psychology. And if we have a birth, we have to have a father. And the father of psychology is normally referred to by a guy by the name of Wilhelm Funt. Um, uh, he studied in Germany, founded the first psychological laboratory, and was the father of what we today call structuralism. He used focused introspection and objective reports to try and figure out what was going on inside of people. Uh, a contemporary of Wundt is Teichner, who really formulated the idea of structuralism. Uh, Teichner was in the United States at Cornell. He conducted introspection experiments aimed at determining basic elements of the mind. The mind being the untouchable, non-material part of what we consider today to be the brain. The mind is nothing more than a, than a concept or uh, the result of neural activity. We move ahead a little bit in the same time as Teichner and a little bit of a, a little past Wundt and we see William James who comes up with the idea of functionalism. James would be the person we would consider to be the father of American psychology. Wundt, the father of all psychology. James, really the first person to bring a course to the United States. What functionalism does that is separate from structuralism is that functionalism focuses its study on the purpose of the process, why we do it, why we feel, what, what is the underlying purpose. Functionalism would really be a precursor to uh, the next step, which would be behaviorism. Uh, behaviorism doesn't have a lot in common with structuralism, but it has a whole lot to do with functionalism. So, Teichner, again, we're looking at structuralism, introspection about objects. It's an idea that is somewhat difficult. It's a, it feels a little philosophical. Teichner would ask participants, tell me about things that are yellow. Not tell me what are yellow things, but tell me about them. And so people would respond that the, the yellow feeling makes me feel warm or the yellow uh, reminds me of something. And so it's looking at how thoughts, once you're given a stimulus, what is going on in the mind? Why are these things linking up? Why do we attribute yellow to warmth? Is it because of the sun and the sun has a yellowish orange color? Is it the fact that uh, my mom always wore a yellow shirt and so I attribute that to warmth? That is a very structural way of thinking of things. Whereas functionalism is all about the stream of thought. It's how do we take what we know and adapt it so that we can use it in the real world. No Psych 101 course is going to be complete until we start talking about one of the major people in psychology, a gentleman by the name of Sigmund Freud. Freud is probably one of the most notorious psychologists or psychiatrists in history. Freud's school of thought basically boils down to he was a proponent of psychoanalytic theory or psychodynamic theory. Freud focused on the abnormal, when the brain does not work appropriately. And he believed that your behavior and your personality is a construct of inner conflict, that you have internal subconscious uh, ideas that you can't access but those inner desires fight with societal expectations. A lot of people in Psych 101 will find Freud to be very off-putting. And I'm usually very upfront with Freud. If you just study him in the way that we see things today, if Freud were to have been your instructor for your Psych 101 class in uh, the 21st century, and he taught the way that he taught and he wrote in his time, 
I would agree. It, he would be very misogynistic. He would be very confrontational. Uh, he would be the traditional sage on the stage where uh, there really is no need for a textbook because whatever came out of his mouth would be the truth or the science. Uh, saying that, he was a very, uh, very brilliant psychoanalyst. Uh, and because he came up with the psychoanalytic model, he would have to be a very, you know, brilliant psychoanalyst. But I think one thing that we tend to forget is while we, we have kind of pushed most of Freud's theories to the side, most every single theory or research method or clinical practice has to tip their hat just a little bit to Freud because he gave us the launching pad for so many of our different theories and practices. Moving forward to the behavioral model, which is a more contemporary model and uh, somewhat controversial, even though it seems relatively straightforward, we have three basic fathers of behaviorism. The true father of behaviorism is often pointed to as Watson. Um, Watson's study on little Albert is something that we look at today as kind of the beginning of behaviorism. And while the structure of the experiment that Watson performed is wholly unethical when we look at it in today's standards, by his day standards, it was perfectly fine. So again, we have to make sure that we're looking at everything through the lens of people in the future looking backwards. The other two individuals, Pavlov and Skinner, are the heads of the two major types of behaviorism that we will discuss in session five. Pavlov was uh, famous for coming up with classical conditioning. And probably if you've heard of Pavlov before, you're having an initial flash of thinking about an animal, specifically the dog. And what's interesting is that that is a great example of classical conditioning. That before you knew anything about Pavlov, you wouldn't have thought about a dog. You wouldn't have thought about a bridge. You wouldn't have thought about a car. You would have just thought, well, that's a name. But because so many times you have, if you've heard about Pavlov before and you know that his seminal research was about uh, working with dogs, immediately you think Pavlov dog or Pavlov's dog. And that's really a form of classical conditioning. You've put the two together. Even though before you knew Pavlov, you wouldn't have put those th two things together. It's almost reflexive for you to think Pavlov and dogs. B.F. Skinner is the father of operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is traditionally the kind of conditioning that we use with children or with families. Parents use operant conditioning, and you use operant conditioning without even thinking about it. Operant conditioning is essentially using punishers or rewards or reinforcements to change the future behavior. In session one, which we are right now, I'm going to go ahead and, and throw out a warning that most students struggle with Pavlov and Skinner's classical and operant conditioning because classical conditioning can get a little cumbersome and it is very uh, technically uh, difficult because of the terms that you have to learn. Skinner, it's pretty straightforward, but a lot of people get confused because they use their uh, common sense and the common sense way of interpreting the terms that we use in operant conditioning doesn't work. For example, I'm quite certain that you have heard or even maybe even used the term uh, negative reinforcer. I'm also almost as certain that you've either heard it or used it incorrectly. Because a negative reinforcer is not a punisher. A reinforcer always increases or maintains the target behavior. But a negative reinforcer, it's like math. It's a minus sign. So it's taking something away that, that is aversive to increase the probability of the behavior. If you do really well on your quizzes in class and you score 100% on your first four quizzes and your instructor takes away the first test because you've already shown that you've conquered the material, that's a negative reinforcer. It's taking away something aversive so that in the future, you're probably going to study hard for those quizzes. Gestalt psychology is a concept that's going to come up throughout the rest of the course. And basically in this section, I just want you to know that Gestalt is basically this, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. When you look at that puzzle sitting in front of you, you probably can, from those small pieces, interpret a picture. 
That's something that your brain intuitively does. Your brain likes to put things together because it categorizes much easier. If I were to draw you a half circle, such as this, most all of you would consider that to be an incomplete circle. However, that could also be described as a curved line. The problem with describing it as a curved line is that we can't encode that in our brain very easily. If I tell you draw a curved line, you might do this. Or you might do this. All of these are accurate, but we can't encode these two very easily because they're just difficult for our brain to complete. But if I describe this as an incomplete circle, that means that the whole the, the, the piece that we can, we can contemplate is greater than the curved line. So the, the definition that we'll use is gestalt being good form or uh, the sum being greater than the sum of the parts. And Gestalt psychologists believe that people naturally seek out patterns. One of the other major perspectives in psychology is the humanistic perspective, brought to us by Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. The humanistic psychologist suggests that human nature is essentially positive, and so when there are negativity, negativities in a person or human nature is skewing towards negative, that there's some kind of imbalance going on. That when you position people with other positive people, they will tend to change for the better. Cognitive psychology is the research of the mental processes, so things like memory and intelligence. Cognitive neuroscience is the mental processes that happen because of our human nervous system. Evolutionary psychology is based on the works of Darwin and based on the theory of evolution and natural selection. The biological perspective uses knowledge about the underlying physiology to explain behavior and mental processes. We look at the biological factors like hormones and genes in the brain to discover why we behave in certain ways and why we think certain ways. When there are deficiencies in these hormones, an imbalance in hormones or genetic issues, we look at the biological model to say what will probably happen and what we can do to control those issues. So if we look here, we can kind of see psychology's roots. Much like a tree, it grows upon itself. That biological perspective with structuralism and functionalism are the, the really the supporting pieces. Functionalism goes into behaviorism, structuralism goes into the cognitive perspective, and then from those we kind of see that the closer they are on this chart, the closer they are in the sciences. We also have the sociocultural perspective, which looks at the impact of segregation and discrimination between races or cultures or religions or groups of people, and it theorizes the importance of sociocultural factors as they relate to development of self, self being who I am today. This is used very heavily in lifespan development and social psychology. So we look at these current perspectives. We see the psychoanalytic, the behavioral, humanistic, cognitive, evolutionary, biological, sociocultural, and biopsychosocial. So at this point, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just think about what you would do uh, in a certain when you were pre presented with a certain question. Given, give me a health, dozen healthy infants, well informed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one at random and train them to become any type of specialist I might select: doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even a beggar, man, and thief regardless of talents, pensions, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. I am going beyond my facts, and I admit it, but so have advocates of the contrary, and they have been doing it for many thousands of years. 
This is a famous speech by John Watson, where basically he purported that his method of behaviorism actually would allow for any type of result that he wanted. If he was given a hundred children and given a label for each of them, if he could completely control the environment, he can make them into anything. Obviously, he's not talking about people with any type of neurological or developmental disability because they do have a ceiling that they can get to. But at this point, I just want you to take a moment and consider this. Do you think that we can manipulate people into a situation where they can be nurtured into anything and everything? If you're with someone right now, take a moment and discuss this. If you're with a class, take a moment and discuss it within the class because you'll get a lot more out of it than just thinking about it on your own. Let's go ahead and take uh, some time and talk about the practice of psychology. The goal is to understand and improve physical and mental health in the practice of psychology. So we'll start with a question. Is a psychologist the same as a psychiatrist? Is a psychologist the same as a therapist? And is a, is a psychiatrist the same as a therapist? When we're done with this section, you will know the answer. A therapist is anyone who practices psychotherapy. So a lot of people in practice will actually use the term psychotherapist or clinical counselor because a therapist could so often mean, uh, could often mean many different things. If you call yourself a counselor, that's also a very common term for a lawyer. If you call yourself a therapist, there are occupational therapists, there are physical therapists, speech therapists, all different types of therapists. So a psychotherapist is one who, go, who does talk therapy. It's unrelated to any formal training, any formal education, and rarely requires licensing. Now, when I say rarely, there are many, many people out there who call themselves a therapist, and in each state, it's different. In the state of Indiana, where Ivy Tech is, we have four basic licenses, and there are, there are small derivatives of each license, but we have the LMHC, which is the Licensed Mental Health Counselor, LMFT, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist, LCSW, Licensed Clinical Social Worker, and the newest license, which is the uh, LCAC, Licensed, Cl uh, Licensed Clinical Addictions Counselor. There are other types of therapists or counselors out there. People like BCBAs, Board Certified Behavior Analysts, who work with people with developmental disabilities uh, and specifically autism. There's no license for that currently, but Indiana is looking towards that. Oftentimes, we're looking at social workers, counselors, religious leaders being our therapists. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor, so you're going to see either MD or DO at the end of their name, who's completed a residency in psychiatry and usually will treat more se severely disturbed individuals. What that means is they're only going to, s to treat people who really need psychotropic medications. People with low-grade depression or anxiety will normally seek out therapists, counselors, and psychi psychologists because the psychiatrist isn't needed at that point. A clinical psychologist will normally have either PhD or PsyD at the end of their name. It used to be that a PhD indicated a research psychologist and a PsyD indicated a uh, practicing cl clinical psychologist, but that's not really all that true anymore. Clinical psychologists are well-versed at diagnosing and treating and doing psychological testing. Most doctoral graduates are in clinical. If you remember back to that pie chart, about 54% of all people who graduate with a graduate degree in psychology are doing it in clinical and counseling psychology. In Indiana, we have an additional license, the HSPP, and it's a very common license, not just in Indiana. The health service provider in psychology are credentialed to offer psychological services. For the most part, you can whittle this down to a very simple thing. Most students remember psychiatrists prescribe medications, psychologists don't. And in most states, you would be fairly accurate, but there are a couple of states who are experimenting with giving prescriptive authority to clinical psychologists who have additional training. 
uh, I believe Arizona is one of the, the very first states to do this. And it's not that they just give the clinical psychologist free reign to, to do prescriptive authority. They essentially have to go through additional training on psychopharmacology that is very close to a program as a PA or an NP, a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner. But they, they are starting to look at, at uh, prescriptive authority. A lot of psychologists don't want that authority. They, they specifically didn't go the psychological or the psychiatric route because they didn't want to be just a, a person who prescribes medications. So there's a lot of people who actually are in the psychology field who don't want prescriptive authority and nobody's going to force them to do it, obviously. We'll talk a little bit here about critical thinking when it comes to pseudopsychology. Pseudopsychology is an approach to explaining and predicting behavior and events that appears to be psychology, but it's not supported by science. Things like astrology and numerology. Historically, one of the most famous examples of a pseudopsychology is something called phrenology. Phrenology was, uh, was a, a quack science that was very popular in the 19th century where clinicians would claim that they could figure out what psychiatric issues you had or what gifts you had by rubbing their hands over your head and feeling the bumps and divots throughout. This was shown to be not very empirically uh, or objectively uh, proven at all. Uh, and I use the word prove very lightly because there are people who will say they proved it, but they just correlated that their, their evidence and anecdotes matched up. Numerology and astrology are uh, along the same line. Uh, they are considered pseudopsychology, false psychology. That does not mean that we know for a fact that they are false, that they are wrong. What we're saying is that pseudopsychology is false psychology. It doesn't fit the rigors of science. If you believe in astrology or numerology, then more power to you. But it, is, it just doesn't cut the mustard when it comes to science. And what we are doing with science is we're using critical thinking skills. We're weighing various pieces of evidence, putting them together, determining how they contribute to the bigger picture. So here is actually an example of phrenology. Uh, this would be a, a typical phrenology map where uh, if you can see this very well, you can see that up in the upper, um, the, the, which would, the upper part of the middle of the head, which would actually be um, the parietal area of the brain, uh, you see the word hope. So if you had a divot right there, it would, it would mean that you have insufficient hope. Uh, if you have a bump there, it means that you have an excess of hope. Uh, right under there is, is um, subtlety, I think, I believe that says. Um, your identity is in there. Uh, your cautiousness, all these things are in there. And we know now that, that your shape of your head is more... Uh, you can more attribute the shape of your head to childbirth and uh, how you were held in the first moments of life than anything else. One term that I want to make sure everybody understands is the law of parsimony, or Occam's razor. You may have heard of this, and a lot of people raise their hand during class and say, yeah, I've heard of that. That was in the movie Contact. And they actually used it relatively appropriately in that movie. Essentially, Occam's razor is that the simpler the explanation, the more uh, likely that the, the explanation is correct. So long-winded explanation of phenomenon oftentimes are too complex. However, there are contemporaries of Occam's who will say that life is simply too easy to say that the simplest explanation is the right explanation. And so there's also people who say that the law of parsimony is incorrect. I'm not saying I'm not giving you this example so that you absolutely know that law of parsimony is right, but just know that it is a component of the scientific method. You will probably be reading scientific articles sometime in your academic career. I can almost guarantee it. A scientific article is written by scholars in the specific field that you're studying. So for psychology, it's mostly written by psychologists, or they may collaborate with, uh, with other professions to do research. As you look at scientific articles, there are certain sections that you need to pay close attention to. And so you need to learn how to read a scientific article before you do uh, actually go out and read it, because if you waste too much time reading certain sections, it's just not going to be beneficial for you academically.
So make sure you do some research on what is a scientific article and what are the components that are important for me as a student. Using the scientific method is the most important thing that there is in any science. It's how we conduct research that shows uh, systematic observation and an exploration of our own critical thinking. There are a lot of different ways that we do research, but experiment is the top of the chain. It shows us that if we manipulate just one variable and keep all of the variables the same between two groups, we can actually prove causation with that one variable that we manipulate. All other types of research that we're going to talk about, they're scientific, but they show us correlations, not causation. So the steps for the scientific method is to first develop a hypothesis, which is basically just asking a question or, or saying what it is that you think uh, causes a phenomenon. We design a study and collect data. We analyze that data. And then we publish the findings so that other people can look at it and say, you know what, you were really blinded to your study. You were really blinded to your hypothesis. And actually what we think is going on here is something completely different. That critical analysis is oftentimes hard for young researchers, but it makes sure that everybody is critiquing each other and we're not just blindly going through the scientific method. Research designs have variables. Variables are those things that change or vary across time and people. The population is all the identified members of a group that we're going to study. From that population, we're going to pull a sample. It's a subset of the population chosen for inclusion in an experiment. The reason we use a sample and not a population is because sometimes our population is going to be way too big. What if we wanted to do a, a study on the sleeping patterns of college students? Well, there's a, probably over a million college students that we could pull from, and I don't have time, and I don't think anybody else has time, to ask or watch a thousand or a million students. So what we have to do is we have to pull out a representative sample. That representative sample is a subgroup that actually matches the characteristics of the population. Random sampling is where we just pull a random subset of the population and put them through the procedure. When we're doing research, there's a couple of very important things that we have to remember. The first thing is we have to get informed consent from the people who are participating. This is an acknowledgement by the study participants that they understand what their participation will entail. This begs the question, can we be deceptive when working with people in social and behavioral science research? And the answer is yes, so long as the deception is necessary. So there may be an opportunity or a time where you have to be deceptive towards the population or else you're going to give away what you're studying and there will be some bias involved. After the research is over, we have to debrief our individuals. We have to let them know what the study was all about so that they can understand why they were maybe manipulated or what the purpose of them volunteering their time was for. We have descriptive, correlational, and experimental types of research. The experimental method, which we've gone over, can determine cause and effect, but the results may not generalize beyond the lab setting, which means that we may be manipulating things too cleanly, and that's not the way the real world works. Correlational research shows whether two phenomena are related, such as um, there are more wrecks when it is snowing. Okay, Those two things are correlated, but did it show that snow caused the wreck? No, it could have been visibility, it could have been that the driver was uncomfortable, that's correlational. So it's not always going to show you cause and effect, it's just going to show you that two things are related. Descriptive, it's good for new research studies, things that we, uh, we haven't studied before, but there's very little control on a descriptive research method. Because the descriptive research method is naturalistic. It's we go out into the environment, but we don't disturb in people, we don't disturb the environment, and we look at the variables as they're operationally defined. So we have to define what we're looking at. The problem is you can have observer bias, where the researcher's value system or expectations is going to mess up the actual observation. Case studies are incredibly important for small groups or individuals that we could not observe naturally. A lot of unique cases have to be studied by uh, 
case studies because it would be unethical or unwise for us to do them in a natural observation. For example, if you wanted to study the sleeping patterns of serial killers, I would suggest doing a case study and not a natural observation. A natural observation would be actually watching serial killers sleep. This is not a good idea for many reasons. First off, it would be wholly unethical for you to know that a serial killer is out there, but let him, you know, let him or her sleep and continue killing so that you can do your research. And secondly, it's just not a good idea to stalk serial killers. They're probably better at it than you are. Descriptive research and case studies really give us a good idea when there's something bizarre or something that we can't uh, explain readily because there just hasn't been a lot of people that we can study. The best example of this is a gentleman by the name of Kim Peek. Uh, Kim Peek was the, uh, was the individual that the character Rain Man was based off of. And he, throughout his life, the re people who researched him thought that he had several different ailments. Uh, in the movie, he's portrayed as having autism, which is not correct. He does have symptoms of autism, but one of the best uh, theories of what Kim's uh, neurological issue was is that he was born with a genesis of the corpus callosum. We'll study the corpus callosum in session two, but basically the corpus callosum is the thin, very dense bundle of nerves that connect the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Kim was born without that, that corpus callosum, so a genesis, no beginning, a genesis of the corpus callosum, which gave him an amazing ability to read textbooks and, and any type of factual book um, in about 15 minutes. He could read your textbook in about 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes. He would read the left page with his left eye, the right page with his right eye simultaneously. And the most amazing thing is he could have upwards of 98% retention of that book from just reading it once. So if you've seen the movie Rain Man, you'll remember the, the uh, scene where he reads the phone book for the night because he's bored and he recalls everybody's phone number and names and addresses. The real Kim Peek probably could have pulled that off. Because his the corpus callosum wasn't there, the left and right hemispheres were not interacting with each other, and so they basically were both sinking in information. Very amazing individual. I think a lot of students would say, hey, uh, I'm, I want to volunteer for a study to see what would happen if you took out my corpus callosum, because awesome, I could read my textbook really quick and I can memorize things. With every neurological issue that gives what appears to be a benefit, there's going to be some significant deficiencies. And for Kim, those symptoms that mimicked autism were really, uh, they were very strong in him. He lived with his father his entire life. Um, at, at a very young age, he was told by doctors that he needed to be institutionalized, that he would not thrive as an individual. Uh, he didn't know how to bathe correctly. He didn't know how to tie his shoes. He could not dress himself. He had a very unsteady gait. Um, the, the neurological difficulties uh, that he had actually were caused by the extreme uh, gifts that he had, but with all the good, there's a little bit of bad. Descriptive research also gives us a lot of information um, about things that we probably could not do uh, in the future because these, the research was either a one-off or basically it might be unethical to do it again like the little Albert experiment. The case of Phineas Gage is one that we'll talk about in session two, about the frontal lobe and how it pertains to your personality. So we will be discussing Phineas quite a bit. HM will also discuss a little bit along with a contemporary of him uh, who lives in Great Britain who has a, a very uh, significant version of uh, uh, memory loss. So we'll be talking about HM quite a bit when we talk about memory. Why we like surveys as part of a descriptive research package, they're really fast. 20 years ago, you had to actually talk to people and call people. Today, we have software like SurveyMonkey.com or just web pages or Facebook, Twitter, where you can send out information and the, the research can come back very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, I can actually create a poll right here using the software that I'm using. Uh, and if there were people live listening, I could actually show a research method right here. It's very quick. Here's the bad thing. Sometimes people are just going to answer because, not because they're going to give you accurate information, because they're either trying to please you or they just want to get through with the research very quickly. Think about a time where you've been to a restaurant lately. 
And at the end of your meal, your waiter or waitress comes up and says, hey, you know, you can do this survey. And if you give if you give me good marks, it's good for me. And you get a free dessert next time you come in. Well, that survey isn't really going to be as as honest as what it might have been because the waitress or waiter is asking you to, to fill it out up positively for you. And she's and he or she is giving you a little reinforcement. And so a lot of people would feel bad if they if they didn't give a good result. So um, th there is a little bit of honesty issue with a with a uh, survey. Survey methods, there again, there's a lot of bias that can be told in there, and it's how you word things. Uh, in, a, in a classic study, research were asked two versions of the same question. Do you think the United States should allow public speeches against democracy, or do you think the United States should forbid public speeches against dem uh, democracy? Very obviously, people don't want things to be forbidden, but the exact same question garnered a much higher rate of saying that we should maybe not allow things. So it's all in how you word a survey that makes the biggest impact. When we're looking at the experimental method, one of the terms that you need to know is the term placebo. Placebo is an inert substance that's given to the control group. It's a fake benefit. It's a sugar pill, and it doesn't have any results, or it shouldn't have any clinical results. Why do we need placebos? Well, because a lot of times, if you give someone a placebo, if you give them what they think is treatment, it will actually work for people. So let's say that I developed a new drug called... Uh, Psychocil psychocillin. And psychocillin allows students to learn psychology much faster than any other type of, of learning. If you take this pill, you're going to learn much quicker psychology. If I just gave all of my students this pill and said, hey, guess what? This is a new pill I'm marketing. Try it out. There's a good possibility that they are going to do a little bit better. First off, because they want to please an individual that it, they're, they're under... Uh, as a professor or as a parent, they're going to try to please that person. Plus, they might just believe, hey, I've got this extra leg up, and I'm going to do better because I've got this extra leg up. So what you would do is you would give half the individuals the real pill and half the placebo, and if both groups increase because they don't know they're getting the placebo, then you know that it's just a placebo effect, that the, there is no clinical, uh, there's no clinical evidence that shows that your, my new drug is making people learn any faster. However, if my group of people who just got the psychocillin actually do better and the, the placebo does, group doesn't, we can say that there is a clinical effect. However, we need to use something called a double-blind study. And a double-blind study is a type of study where neither the researchers nor the person actually conducting the study know who's getting what. That way, we don't have experimental bias. It doesn't, my, my impact does not, uh, or my being there doesn't impact the study. Because if I wanted the clinical studies to find that my pill was actually working, I could easily just focus my attention on the people that I know got the pill, or I could grade them a little bit easier and get the results that I wanted. Nobody really expects cartoons to hurt children. But we have had studies that have shown that watching just nine minutes of high-energy, ultra-stimulating kids, like, kids shows like SpongeBob experience a temporary dip in cognitive functioning. Now, does that mean that SpongeBob makes you dumb? Not really, because what we do know is that there is ethical guidelines that we have to follow in research, and there's a good possibility that that wasn't the only thing being shown. So just because somebody watches this and temporarily does worse afterwards doesn't mean that there's a causal link between the two. And that leads us to the end of the first session of Psych 101. I want to thank everybody for listening, and if there are any questions, please direct them to your instructor.
or you can reference the textbook that you are using for this class. Thank you and have a great day.